Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Amphibian Press podcast. Today, I'm talking to Janie Dempsey-Watts. She is a uh, literary fiction and creative nonfiction author, and she just released her first children's book, so we'll get to that. Uh, Hi, Janie. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Great. Thank you for having me on today. I'm glad to be here. You're welcome. Um, So to start, let's just talk a little bit about you and your history with writing in general. Well, I guess I should have got my diary out. I started writing when I was about nine. Um, and my, they gave me a diary, my parents did, but what happened was a little colt froze to death that was one of our horse's uh, babies. And my father and I discovered it. And so I was really upset and I wrote all about it in the diary in kind of a news format, very sparse writing and more factual, uh, but it helped me sort of heal from it. And later I wrote a chicken soup for the soul story about it. When I was a grown-up, many, many years later, it really bothered me. We tried to resuscitate the cult, um, and really you can't do that, but I think it was my father's way of trying to give me hope till I could sort of process it. Yeah, that makes sense. I grew up on a farm, too, so I had that kind of Mm. early, rough introduction to death. (laughs) Yes, Uh, what an introduction. Don't wish it on anyone. No. (laughs) Um. And it, that was one of the things that I dreaded with my kids because we we don't we have animals but we don't we're not on a farm or anything. Um, mm-hmm. But we had we lost a cat and I had to tell my son that his cat died and it was, oh, it was hard. awful. It's um, hard. Yeah. But the thing you can tell them, and we had to put a dog down about two weeks ago. We, my favorite dog, Bella, American Bulldog. Um, we feel that they live on in our hearts. So if you know that love never dies, they can't kill it, death can't kill it, and the animal's love lives on for you in your heart. And that's really a nice thought because that is, that's not dead. Yeah, that is a nice so, thought. I like that. Yeah. Um, Sorry to get off into this more of a track already, but hey, it maybe happens. it'll come out in a book someday. Um, it happens. Yeah. So, um, you, so you started with your, because you went to school for journalism, right? Yes. I, well, I actually started out in uh, writing for the high school newspaper back at Chattanooga High School. And then I got into the local university there, University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, wrote for their newspaper. And I was in English for about a year and a half. And it was a great subject, but I didn't want to sit around and analyze people's work that were long dead and their great works. Instead, I wanted to write. So I realized I needed to be major in journalism. So I moved to California, applied to the University of California, Berkeley, and got in, which was shocking to me, uh, considering some of my grades um, during high school. Uh, but I sort of redeemed myself in between at another university. And um, the rest is history. And then after that, I got a newspaper job. So. That's great. I, I love anybody who, who makes a living from their writing is exciting for me. <laughs> I'm not sure if we could call it a living, but it was certainly a way to have a little bit of food. Well, yeah, food helps. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so your first book, I'm sorry, I didn't write down the title. It's Ret- uh, Moon Over Taylor's Ridge. I can hold it up and okay. people can see it. This is my first book that came out in 2012. And it was uh, traditionally published by a small press. And um, it I, mean, I got a great response with it because they also help publicize it a little bit, but usually it landed in my field that I had to do most of it, but it was set locally and I got a big following and um, it was the community wide read back in 2013. It's a literacy effort and I was very happy about that. So a lot of people read it and of course I spoke and I've been out and about a lot talking about it, but when I meet people, they always look at me and say, Hey, didn't you write that moon over Taylor's Ridge? And I say, yes, I did. So it did real well. And um, I like this one. It's got a lot of Cherokee history in it, but it's about a woman that comes home to settle her father's estate and gets sucked into the search for this legendary Cherokee silver mine, which is up on Taylor's Ridge, which is, this is the actual ridge. Oh, cool. It's a historic place in this area. That's great. Um, So how long did it take you to write Moon Over Taylor's (sighs) Ridge? Gosh. Okay. So here's the deal. I started, I took a class at UCLA in novel writing. I had done a lot of screenwriting in the um, late eighties and early 1990s. And I took the class in, I believe it was 90, 
98 or 97. And then I wrote the novel in under two years, but then I spent a few years rewriting it and sending it out to traditional agents. And all of them rejected it, but of course some said, oh, well, if it would only be a little less plot oriented and more character driven, we would take another look. So I think I spent about another six months or a year slanting it that way. And when I sent it back in, of course, that lady was no longer at that agency, mm -hmm. but I had a really good book. And then I went to various um, writing consultants and people that gave me their input. And it, it turned out very well, but it took me a long, long time. And I spent, I might've spent, I mean, a decade sending it out and getting rejected. And then I thought, wait a minute, I'll be dead by the time this thing's published. So I decided to look for a small traditional publisher rather than self-publish. And that worked really well for me. It was called Little Creek Books. It's an imprint of something called JCP now. Mm -hmm. so. Nice. I, I'm a fan of the small press. <laughs> yes, yes, I love them. Yes, you would be. Small presses are great. Um, so that's, that's kind of cool. Where did you get the, the idea for this? Is it something that a story that you grew up with or? Yes. The story of the legendary Cherokee silver mine is written down in a history book in this County in Georgia, where I live called Catoosa County. And when I got to researching the story in a history book that they have, I was surprised to find out it was my late aunt who penned the story, the mm -hmm. actual legend. And I never knew that, but I'd heard the story a lot. And we climbed up and down that ridge a lot. And we went on something called snipe hunts. I don't know if you've heard of that. Well, they take a bunch of kids out that are of a certain age, sort of little enough still to be uh, gullible. Some of us remain gullible, by the way. <laughs> but <laughs> they took us out and we went up the side of the ridge in the evening and they pretended we were looking for a snipe. And of course you never find a snipe, but along the way people jump out and scare the heck out of you. <laughs> and that was sort of a rite of passage down here. I wrote about that once in a, an essay, but um, anyway, that that's kind of like the silver mine. And she, it started out to just be about a story about a woman settling her daddy's estate, but I decided to broaden it, and include a lot of the history. And that really helped, I think. Uh, plus her marriage is unraveling in California where she lives. And she comes back here just to settle his state and her whole life falls off course. So a lot of women kind of, I believe, uh, related to the book from that point of view. And a lot of my other readers really enjoyed the Cherokee mine, silver mine part. And there's a main character in it named Zyla who's 70. And I really like Zyla. She runs this, the county store or this little store in the area. And what's interesting about Zyla, she's who I'd like to be when I get older, but, um, she popped up in my second book, which is not a sequel. And believe me, I was shocked too. <laughs> you know how those characters are? She just that. got herself in there. <laughs> That's one of my favorite parts of writing. <laughs> yes, yes. They just, they're like those gopher things that pop up that you try to smash with that hammer at the, the video. The whack-a-mole. <laughs> uh, the mole. Yeah, the whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole. That's it. That's it. <laughs> um, so you have two books that you have moon over taylor's ridge and then return to taylor's ridge okay return to taylor's crossing taylor's and crossing i'm sorry that's all right this one is very interesting um this book is about a ku klux klan attack that occurs in the book in 1959 this is a fictional account inspired by a real klan attack that occurred when i was quite little so I might have been in the early, maybe like 1955 or 56. I don't know because I didn't know numbers yet. But we came to the breakfast table one morning. My dad and mother were very upset. We lived in the city of Chattanooga, but our farm was down in the country in northwest Georgia. And it seems that the Klan had taken it upon themselves to come down and attack in the middle of the night um, my grandmother's uh, farmhand who worked at our dairy. And he came, they came in, beat him up, told him never, never to return, scared the heck out of him, and then, uh, you know, ran him off and set grandmother's cabin on fire. He did, he lived there and as part of the deal. And uh, fortunately, it smoldered out. But the whole event upset me for my whole life and shaped my outlook on racism because I experienced a lot of it down here. I mean, obviously, they weren't racist towards me but people acting as though this was a normal thing. And that's one reason I moved away to California uh, for a long time and now I live here again. 
it's better now. I'm sure it's not perfect, but it's better than it was. Anyway, I had to write this book as a kind of, um, not revenge, because you can't really get revenge. But what I did was I gave this character a girlfriend. I didn't know him that well, because I was little when he, this all happened. But I gave him a girlfriend, and they're very much in love. And they're young. He's 19, and she's 17. And I added uh, the, his little sister. So there's three African-American characters and three white characters, uh, the villain and other supporting characters. and. Two of the characters are best friends, a little um, African-American girl and a little white girl, and they ride horses, much like I did. And so the story just kind of grew and grew and grew, and I had to write it. I had a writing expert. Um, I went to have a one-on-one -on -one with her, and she's a very um, well-known novelist, and she said, do not, do not, not, not write this story. This is not your story. Why are you writing this story? I said, I have to write this story. But I wrote it anyway, and it took me a long, long time. It was spread out over five years, uh, but I was also marketing the other book, and I moved from uh, California to Georgia. So there was a lot going on. Did a lot of research, and it spans, the love story spans 50 years. In my research, I traveled to Florida to research a group called the Highway Men Artist, and they are uh, African-American artists that were very popular in the 60s and 70s down in Florida. And I met one of them, one of their brothers, a lot of them have passed on because um, they would be a lot older. I met one of his brothers and toured an area called Blacktown. And I was looking to see where one of the artists had lived. Well, we were passing a little house and he said, oh, uh, that's where Zora Neale Hurston lived. And I went, what? And he said, she was friends with these artists. And then I got it in my head to put her in the book, uh, mm -hmm. cameo scene. So it's very literary. It's won some awards. And it's out of all my books, it's the one I am um, feel the proudest of. Because I feel that maybe it'll make a difference if somebody knows about the history so we don't repeat it again right. and again and again. So I'm very proud of it. And I feel like a long time from now, this book hopefully will help somebody understand what the problem was back in the day. But it's fiction, and like I said, it is a love story, so it's very satisfying from that point of view. But it's spread out over 50 years. He comes back looking for her, uh, that man does, for the girlfriend. Because this attack breaks them up for mm -hmm. 50 years. Oh, that sounds like um, a really good story. I, have, you, uh, have you had any feedback from readers about it? Oh, yes, they like it a lot. Um, I, I usually I have a lot of feedback on Amazon, and a lot of them will ask questions about it. Uh, you know, I live in the South now, so it hasn't been as well received as this one, which features uh, all white characters. Um, or maybe it's just because people don't, they like this, it's a love story too. They don't want to think about um, the problems, and maybe that's it too. I mean, but they like it a lot. And we, I'm actually, has spoken more about the first book and even my short story collection than I have this one, but I've actually given speeches at um, a few groups about this, book clubs and other places. I think I, I gave a whole speech about a year and a half ago about it. That's my favorite thing is when they invite me to give a speech and then I can take uh, questions and answers. Yeah. It's fun. Um, well, I'm really glad that you wrote it because I think we need more stories like that. Um, I think it's really important to make sure that we don't repeat history, especially the really bad parts. Mm. <laughs> so I'm glad that you did. I'm, I mean, it sucks that that happened when you were a kid and, but I'm glad that you turned it into something positive. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's talk about your short story collection. This is a short story collection. And um, yes, that is a picture of me and my grown son on the front. But this is Mother, Sons, Beloveds, and Other Strangers. Um, in other words, it's a collection of different um, stories about relationships, but in different settings. A third of, or half the stories are down south. And uh, the fourth of the stories are in California, where I lived for 35 years. And then a fourth of the stories are set in Europe, where I've gone at different times with this son, who usually takes me, mm -hmm. although the last time we went, well, actually, we did. He took us to Paris. And there's not a Paris story, but that will lead to the next book that I'm going to show you in a minute. But yes, these are, it's, a, it's been well received. I haven't pushed as much as I should have on this book. Uh, I could market it more. It only came out, I believe it was last April, so it's just been out a little over a year. And 
I don't know really if it's not if I haven't pushed so much as that people really don't read short stories as much as they do novels has been my um, thing I've noted about it. But a lot of them have been already published in literary magazines and um, anthologies. So it's a collection of them. Some haven't been published. The very last one is called Ariche. And Ariche is in Sicily and it's a, a town that's in a medieval, uh, it's a medieval town and it's very high up and on a you can, if you, on a clear day, you can always see pretty far out, almost to Africa. But that story is uh, about a woman with empty nest syndrome. And that story, the reason I'm talking about it, was a finalist in the William Faulkner Pirates Alley competition a long time ago. I think it was 2004. And I flew down there and I loved that. I didn't win, but I loved the experience. And then another story was a semi-finalist in that same competition in 2005. That's great. Um, mm -hmm. So what made you start to do the short stories? Was it just to get them in magazines or? No, what made me do the short stories? I got so frustrated waiting for these agents. And by the way, I do think it's good to try, but after about five years, I mean, you really have to think, do you want to keep just sending out things and getting rejected or do you want to just go for it? And I decided to just go for it. I didn't want to die with nothing published, but, uh, during that time, I thought, well, let me do some short stories to get these published, and that'll make me more credible. And it did. Um, not credible enough to get the big guns, but the very first agent out that liked my book was Nicholas Sparks' agent, but rejected me, but was complimentary, my first book. So I knew that I wasn't that bad a writer, or they wouldn't have said that. So that was good. Um, but, you know, you just got to keep doing different things. And the short stories are a good way to develop your skill Mm -hmm. And I wrote a blog about it once. It's like going on a nice date or a series of dates, but you don't marry the idea. Whereas a novel, you marry that thing and you marry it for two to five to 10 years. And that's a struggle. But a short story, if you don't really like it after a little bit, you can just dump it and move on to the next thing. <laughs> that's the appeal of short stories. So I did I, all these I decided to stay with, obviously. There, I have one sitting over here. It's about a sailboat ride. I never finished that story because I started that when I think it was in the 90s. And it just, with everything going on in the world, it just seemed so shallow compared to my other stories. Uh, it seemed a little bit like the people in The Great Gatsby, mm -hmm. but not with the depth, like just in one of the scenes. You know, I didn't have a real good hook going on that one. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. I don't know. I think I'd just move on to the next story and let that sit there as an unpublished sort of part story. Yeah. <laughs> You know, um, you know about those. Yes, <laughs> I know all about those. Um, so then your your newest story is a children's book called Pap Pap Goes to Paris. Yes, I'm so excited. Um, what it is, is we, we did go to Paris for a wedding anniversary. Our son, uh, our grown son, met us there. He sponsored the trip, and we were so happy. I'd been there several times, but my husband hadn't been to there. He'd been overseas, but never to Paris. So... Anyway, um, we got on a plane in Atlanta, and as the plane was taking off, he squeezed my hand and looked at me, and he said, Pap Pap goes to Paris. <laughs> and I went, oh, I said, that's my next book. Because our little grandson, who at the time was three, begged to go with us. He wanted to know what was there. Could he come? And I said, well, I don't think your parents would let you. I would have brought him if they would have. Um, but I said, well, the Eiffel Tower, because everybody knows about that. So then I have a snow globe of the Eiffel Tower. He wanted to see the Eiffel Tower. Let me see if I can find that snow globe. Uh, here it is. This is my snow globe of the Eiffel Tower. And he wanted, and, and it looks similar to this one. He wanted to see the Eiffel Tower because um, he wanted to know how tall it was. And he was obsessed with this. And this preceded our trip. So then when my husband said that on the plane, um, of course, I enjoyed all the sights, but in my mind, I started writing this little story. And it's the traditional size for a children's book, 32 pages. And I have a great artist named Lynn Martin. She had worked, uh, she lives in Chattanooga, where, you know, up the street, I mean, up the road about 30 minutes. But she was brought up in the same neighborhood, and I never knew her growing up. She's a little younger than I. But the best part was she did this wonderful art. We collaborated. I told her the scene ideas that I had. And she pretty much executed them with a, some slight variations in a couple of the scenes, but it's how I envisioned it. And since I'd done screenwriting for 10 years, I think visually, so as soon as I thought 
of the text or the copy, I would think of the scene that would go with it. Now I'm trying to think, I'm gonna show you my favorite picture. This is when they arrive in Paris and, and Pat Pap and grandfather are walking down the street Aww. to the cafe. And then this is in a Paris cafe. See the little doggy? Mm -hmm. Well, that's actually what I saw. We went to get breakfast one morning and the, the um, yeah, with the waiter, a little dog, a lady came over the dog on the leash and it hopped up in the chair and put its paws on the table and started waiting on the dog and put the bib on it. I was like, okay, I love dogs, but this is even more than my dogs. Um, and then, oh, and while we were in the process of finalizing the book, we had to put our dear dog down. She was quite ill. She was 11. Her name is Bella. So my artist on the very last page, which is kind of a glossary or pronunciation guide to some of the words. See this little Aww. dog? That's what my dog looked like, except she was bigger. So she changed it from black to white to white to black. Aww. And it's a tribute to little old Bella. So I'm really happy about this book. And um, it just came out May 3rd, and I'm just now getting the word out. But I, do you want to hear about the worst marketing thing I just did already? Yes. <laughs> okay. This, I want to highly advise people not to do this one. Uh, it was an Amazon giveaway. So I picked... Mm -hmm. I would give away five books and I signed up. I thought I filled it all out correctly. And I think it came to like 80 something dollars. That's not, I mean, you could go to meals a couple of times, you know, lunches or something. So that's not a real large amount, but that's large to me right now. And so I did that. And then I thought they'll and notify me when it's time. And then I will certainly put it on Facebook and the usual channels like Twitter. Well, the next morning I woke up and it said, your Amazon giveaway started at 11.25 p.m. and it was over at 11.35. And I was like, whoa, what happened? What about me? You didn't tell me. So I called them up and they said, oh yes, that's exactly how it happened. And I'm said, well, I think maybe something was rigged. I mean, how could all five copies go that quickly? And they said, well, you, in that, next time you do it, and I'm, lady, there ain't going to be a next time. But they said, you can put in the time you want it to happen. I didn't see that anywhere. Hmm. And uh, three of the winners had the same name with different variations on the end of the name. So I just thought, was it a robot or what happened? Or there were kids sitting somewhere just entering everything at all those hours at night while the parents are asleep? I don't know. But for me, it was very, very unfruitful. It, I might as well just take in the money and given it to a charitable cause, which it might have been a better use of the money. I just felt really ripped uh, or maybe just thrown it out to the wind. Then at least somebody could capture the money. But I, I'm sure these, I don't think I'll get reviews out of either, either. But I mean, if somebody's used it successfully, I would love to hear. Maybe I just didn't do it right. But uh, that was my worst experience. But I'm trying other things. That's, um, I always kind of wondered about that because they always have that Amazon giveaway option. Um, I hadn't tried it yet. Um, but how was it writing a children's book versus, um, a novel? Cause I've heard it's a really hard transition to make. Hmm. Well, for me, uh, I'm in a writer's group called Chatter Rosa. So it was not, I mean, I wrote the book and then I let them workshop it with me and they gave me suggestions. I'll give you an example. Um, when the little boy says, Oh, well, see, the Eiffel Tower has almost 700 stairs you can climb. I did do that in 2006. Not this trip. I didn't, but I did. And so the little boy says to the Pat Pat, are you going to climb all 700 stairs? And the Pat Pat says, in the first version I wrote, he said, if I have a fibler, defibrillator, how do you pronounce it? Defibrillator, you know, the thing that starts. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I always want to say Phil Bulbright. Anyway, <laughs> he had that heart machine and I thought it was hilarious and my friends laughed, but they pointed out that a children, A, might not understand it. And if they did, it might freak them out. Right? <laughs> and I have kind of that dark sense of humor thing. So I said, well, okay, I'll change it to if his knees cooperate. That's more, less offensive. And uh, so they helped me workshop it a little bit. And so it wasn't, I mean, for me, it wasn't that hard. Now, I think it's a good story. There's a little bit of an arc. At first, there was no arc. And one of my writing group members said, you have to give it, make it a little bit more so it's more of a challenge. And so I make him be frightened about the tower at the last minute because it's very, very large when you stand beside it. And he's like, I don't think I can do this. But yet what I have happened is, and the grandfather encourages him and he goes, okay, we'll just do it one step at a time. And on the way up, they do a game where they say Parisians like, and then the little boy says dogs, Parisians like cobblestones and so forth. So I made that kind of fun. So for me, 
it wasn't as hard as you think because I have a grandchild that age. So mm -hmm. I know what they think about. And, and I really liked it. But the worst part was having to deal with the art. Because unless you're an artist, you've got to hire an artist if you're going to produce your own book, which I did. Mm -hmm. And that was quite pricey. She's very excellent. She's a professional. And then the other thing is um, the program she used with the, the words, she didn't just copy and paste my PQ Perfect manuscript, which had no errors. She had to hand type it in every time because her program didn't have that copy and paste feature. Mm -hmm. So I kept finding errors. And I'm used to working in Word, so I was completely horrified because I would send back one and say, correct, this, these two errors, and it come back with errors that had been made before. But see, she thinks visually in pictures, and I think words. Mm -hmm. So when you proofread it, this is the other thing, you because her pictures are so good, you've got to cover those pictures up and focus on words because you too will get sucked into the pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So that's the worst part about it. Would I do it again? Well, we'll see how this book does. I hope it does well. But if it didn't do very fabulously well, I probably wouldn't because of the expense of the artist. Unless I could do a, a agreement where we did it on consignment. But I wouldn't expect her to work for free either. Yeah. Um, I could probably try a traditional publisher because I have other ideas for children's books. And then again, I have other ideas for novels. But it was more fun than the adult novel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just a little lighter. Uh, there wasn't anything terrible going on. It was all funny and cute and hopeful. And I felt that I wanted a hopeful book to kind of counterbalance all the negativity in our news these days. And I wanted a little breathing room from all the heavy duty stuff of life. So it was a good solution for me. I understand that. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um so are you doing um just on the marketing front i can't help it um have you talked to like schools and libraries and done that i'm kind of thing? gonna be doing that um i i i want to do a library event in june that they're having um i haven't set up individual signings yet i haven't even written the press release i'm hoping to do that today to get it out to the local press i have one book signing in my hometown and it's a nice shop that did it last year for my short stories and that usually starts to get the word out. And I like to get the word out. And then this one's geared for three to seven years old. So I would like to do readings. Yes, I think that'd be great. Now, whether or not I'll actually sell books at those readings, it'll get the word out. But the thing is, if you think about it, if the kids are at school, they don't usually bring money for books. So I don't know that unless I handed out bookmarks and they told mom and dad about it. Um. But when I was a kid, sorry, I don't uh -huh. mean to interrupt you, but when I was a kid, when we had the authors come speak to us, we were always, a, we bought our books ahead of time. Oh. And then we had them so they could sign the book at the end of the reading. Smart idea. Thank um, you and for that, that was, tip. <laughs> that was, um, the one that I really remember um, doing that with was um, the woman who wrote my, um, So Far From the Bamboo Grove. Uh, that which was it's an older book it's uh it was her memoir about when she was a kid in mm. um south korea and japan during world war ii so mm. that one was a little bit more serious but i i think i was 11 when we did it but um i thought that was a good idea to have because we all bought the books and i think we read them even before she came and then we got to talk to her about it that's a great idea and I've, I haven't done any children's book marketing yet, but I started researching it because my sister was the artist for a book. Oh. Um, and that's Ratty Rat and the Midnight Snack is the name of that one. Ratty Rat and the Midnight Snack. I like that. I and can relate. So, I, yeah. So I, I started researching it and I, I've seen over and over again that doing um, the schools and the libraries and stuff is the best way to market like to children. So thank um, you for that. I, haven't I should start on that. Of course, then they're all out for the summer. But I was thinking there's a, a big event. Now, that's the other thing. You know, you can end up selling 10 books and spending 300, 400 on the trip. Mm -hmm. But there is a big event in Savannah, Georgia in the fall. And I really like to go because I've heard they have a lot of children's books. That's about five and a half hours away. Always a good excuse for a trip to Savannah, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but again, is, will you really sell enough to justify it? Maybe not, but sometimes those trips, you get a few books out and then you get an invite later to speak. Uh, once I was invited to speak at the Georgia Library Association and 
they pay you a fee and you pay your own hotel, but you come out a little bit ahead and that makes it worthwhile. And then you get to speak to the librarians. And I did that, but that was about, I want to say 2013. A lot came out of that first book. And then a lot of people expect you to do the sequel. I haven't. I had one in mind. But again, after doing the second book, which was so serious and literary, I didn't know if I could do the lighter one again. So I haven't yet. I mean, it was a good book, but it was it was more funny than it was really de deeply serious, I thought. So mm -hmm. we'll see what the, what the muse wants. Yeah, <laughs> see what happens. Um, so let's talk uh, just for a minute about your creative nonfiction. You mentioned a couple stories that you had in Chicken Soup for the Soul. Uh, what was that like? That was a really great experience. That's when I first got published on a wide uh, range was through those stories. Well, wait a minute. Yeah, that was. A lot happened in 2003, but that was one of the things, the one about the little frozen colt. I sent it in. I, I was on there one day, and I was on a writer's site, and it said they were looking for horse stories. And I'm like, well, I know I have a horse story. So that was so easy, and I wrote it and rewrote it, and it went really smoothly, and they were very professional. And then I had other little stories I thought of from time to time about things that I saw the book titles that fit. I submitted one again about two years ago, didn't have a word, and I didn't know why that was. I um, wasn't worried about it. So I used it later for a um, blog, because sometimes I do a little blog, not very often though, because I'm always busy doing everything else. Mm -hmm. And I love that publishing for them. Those stories are highly respected. Everybody's heard of it. And that sort of got me used to the whole idea of book signings and promoting the stuff, because before that I didn't have anything to promote. And um, Another one I wrote for was Guidepost, the big magazine, the Christian magazine that goes out all over the world, I guess. But I loved writing that story and they paid me. And then they chose that story and put it in an anthology for grandmothers. And that story was about my own grandmother who used to pick okra. And then we spent time together. She would wash it and chop it up and then roll it in cornmeal and flour and put salt and pepper and fry it and she would fry it for maybe 45 minutes to an hour until it was golden brown and what the story is about is about how we bonded over her okra and she was sort of nurturing me and the whole time we would talk and she would tell me about okra and how it needed to cook a long time and it was just a really wonderful experience so that story sometimes the stories grow and they go into other formats in fact that okra story has been in about four different publications, various versions of it, because I own the stories. You know, you own all your own copyrights. Mm -hmm. If you don't, make sure you get them. <laughs> but I always do. <laughs> um. Gosh, what else are we going to talk about? <laughs> We've covered a lot. Um. Want to talk about bookmarks? <laughs> You have a bookmark story? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I, this first bookmark was good. It was easy to do, and it had me on the back. The publisher did that, and I paid them, though, for it because it was for my own use. And then I was asked to speak. I was the Appalachian Writer Series, and they made me a special one on their printing press, and I'm real proud of this one. And then this one, I ordered it short, but it, it was a good thing. I did it. But... The first version of it, again, proofreading is going to prove to be my nemesis. <laughs> um, no, I'm sorry. I think it was this one. Yes. This one, this is for the short story. In the back, it's, it tells the bio, and it said, a native, native of the Chattanooga with strong roots. I must have proofread it a thousand times, but you can't say that. So I threw away $80 worth of these bookmarks. And so... <laughs> That's my story. You've got to really proofread it because then you either live with it and look illiterate or you correct it. And, you know, I keep a lot of times I have proofreading problems and then I'll have to, to create space. You, if you're in a book format like this, mm -hmm. you can get uh, used to have they could let you correct 20 of those for $70. But they've now changed the way that they I'm pretty sure they don't offer correction services anymore. I think you have to change the whole manuscript. I don't know if you've experienced that lately. But with this one, I want to put it in Kindle, but they've told me that um, 
they don't, I did try to with their little automatic program on there and the pages were out of order. People's heads were chopped off. Now that's not very comforting for children. No, <laughs> so, that's not good. <laughs> not to mention they were sideways, upside down. So I haven't figured that out yet. So if you don't see it come out in Kindle, it means I couldn't figure it out. And I'm not, I'm okay technically, but not fabulous. But it just was a shame because I think my grandson loves to read books on Kindle. And um, one about this brown bear, it's a, a rhyming story. You may have heard of that brown bear, brown bear. And then I don't know the rest of it, but he, he was, loves reading that story. And he would love to read this on Kindle, but <clears throat> it may not make it. We'll see. Um, we did, we put the ratty rat story on Kindle. And I think we did it by uploading a PDF. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I think that's how we did it. It was a while ago. But, Did it do um, well on Kindle or better in paperback? I don't know. I haven't talked to him. I haven't talked to the author recently. Okay. Um, but I can ask. Um, I don't know. He's, know. he's not doing a ton of, because he's also a teacher. Um, okay. So he just, he's almost done with the school year. And I think then he'll kind of amp up what he's doing with the book. Sure. Um, well, that, that is a consideration. I, I was saying I'm a uh, instructor in a writing lab at a college and it's true when you're working it's hard to do all this other stuff so in the summer you try to cram it all in the summer and you do a little bit during the school year but it's a lot harder mm -hmm. uh, like especially if you go out and speak to a book club to like 10 o'clock at night you get home at 11 and turn around and get up and go to work that's kind of hard yeah <laughs> I need my sleep that just makes me, me tired just thinking about it <laughs> me too me too <laughs> And then you, then you don't push as hard because you think, well, I don't want to be tired at work. And then you don't like, well, the, 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 this book here, I haven't pushed as hard. Uh, a lot of people want me to come and I'm like, no, I'm really not doing anything during the weekdays. And that cuts out a lot of book clubs, especially women's book clubs. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway. Um, but yeah, so where can people find you online? Uh, I have my own website, which is www.janiewatts.com. And um, I attempt to update the web page and what I know. And I did add the cover of my new little children's book, but it's not as user friendly a web page as I'd like. So at some point in the next year or so, I would like to look into getting a, one a little bit more that I can get it going a little quicker. But what I've done is, since it's so hard to move the books around the way I want and put, I mean, I put the big one there, but it's up there next to the second novel. And that doesn't really work in my mind, the children's novel next to heavy duty literary. But I want to be able to um, do that and put the more current ones there, or maybe all four titles. But um, I've been using the blog. There's a blog tab. So I just say, click on the blog to read more about the new book. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the readers will see that. But um, my son set that, my computer son set that up for me a while back, but he lives in California and it's hard to get him focused on my work because he has his work now. He's grown. Right. So that's one of my goals though. I want to get a user friendly uh, web page that I can operate because I'm not, I mean, I'm pretty good at it if you just, once I know what I'm doing. So that's a good goal. Um, Weebly is pretty user friendly. Weebly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's weebly.com. That's what I use for the Amphibian Authors website. If you go Weebly. have a look at that. I'm going to write that down. And then the other one that I use is actually, I'll send you a link. Um, the creative pen does like a whole thing on how to walk through it. But my um, website is CameronQuinnBooks.com, And I use WordPress with the author pro theme from studio press. Studio okay. something studio. I think it's studio press, um, but I'll send you the link so you can check both those out. Cause they're both really user friendly. Cause I don't have time to mess with the web page for hours. <laughs> Yeah, I know. That's the way I am. And it's like to do the, um, I've been on TV a lot. I've done a lot of uh, interviews, but, or it's been in the newspaper, but I can't figure out how to link a lot of that to my webpage. So you look at it, you think, oh, she's only had about 10 interviews. Well, no, I only had those hyperlinks added when my son did it. Or if I call him and say, please, please, please put this hyperlink up. But I'd like to be able to link all the press coverage so, or especially if it's an interview, so you can hear more about what the books are about. Right. So, and like the, your interview today, I would like to be able to get it up there, but I'll figure it out somehow. <laughs> you can do it, but I'll, I'll send you that, that link. Cause that's pretty easy. And you can have a look at my site. If you want to just see what it looks, you can customize it. Mine is urban fantasy. So it's like got urban a fantasy, but, uh, 
yeah, I'll send you that link. Thank um, you so much. Thank you. And thank you for talking to me today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. I'm just going to stop this.